is tape 4 of the video series on using Brodak dope. During this series we're trying to do the uh, final, actually we're ready to do clear. We've been working on the I-Beam Spitfire 1999 model. And I hope by now you've seen tape 1, 2, and 3 and you're well on your way to having a really nice finish of your own. At about this time, I always like to look around the model, make sure there's no little flaws or anything that I don't want to bury in the clear. And I want to, of course, get the first coat on a little thicker, roughly 50% thinner, but never put the first coat on, put the first coat of clear on super wet. You run the risk of melting the canopy, the ink lines. You want to get the first couple of coats on dry. When I say dry, I mean roughly 50% thinner. Now, the idea is always to get the first coat on relatively thick. It'll be orange peely. Add a little more thinner to the next coat, the next coat. Each coat progressively adding a little more thinner. That's one really good technique that I like to use. We're going to try to get that first coat on nice and dry, though. I don't want to take any chance we're going to be melting anything. And the other part of this is we don't want to use less, never, never, less than 50% Brodac thinner to Brodac dope. Anything less than 50%, you run the risk of not getting a good chemical bond. Okay, so let's get down to the shop and let's get some paint flowing. Well, on the last tape, one of the things we just didn't get enough room to finish on was the outlining of the shark's teeth. And that's on one of our previous tapes. Using a French curve, I had to individually put in each tooth, and it was an extremely time-consuming process, but I think the results are well worth it. We're ready to take this apart, but what I always do is take all my small parts off the plane, all the little pieces I can spray individually, and do a little test with the clear to make sure that I don't have any moisture in the air that's going to affect the final clear coats. First thing I always do is take one of the small parts that's detachable from the plane, find a way of mounting it or holding it, spray up a 50-50 mixture, 50% 50 Brodac clear, 50% thinner. Usually that's a little bit thick to spray at 25 pounds, so you have two choices. You can go up in pressure to 30 pounds, or you can add a little thinner. In this case, I'm going to add just a little thinner. It'll probably come out to about a 55% mix of thinner. Now, the reason I want to do this one little part, and then I'm going to go have lunch, because I want to look at this after it dries in the environment where it'll be drying for a half an hour. The reason for that is in our area of the country, you never know when humidity is going to be too high. So if this dries a half hour from now without any cloudiness, we'll go on and paint the other planes. It'll skin over in a little bit, maybe a little less than a half an hour even. But when it skins over, dries to the touch with absolutely nothing clouding over, we know it's safe to spray. Now if it did cloud over, the easiest thing we could put is a little bit of Brodac retarder in. But I'd like, especially on the first coat, not to have any retarder. So what I'll do for this very first coat, I want the first coat to go on relatively thick. I'm not concerned with chemical adhesion right now. I'm not going to put any more tape over this plane. I'd like to get the first coat on relatively dry, and then each time I spray another coat, another coat, and another coat, each time I put another coat on, just add maybe a spoonful of thinner to the gun, so that toward the end I'll be up around maybe 70% thinner, 65% thinner, and that last coat will flow right out. So let me go outside, and it, it had, it's supposed to rain today, but it isn't, so I don't know what the humidity is. But let's get a little test on this, and then set it aside to dry. Now, it turned out to be that relatively sunny out there, but the wind is blowing about 100 miles an hour, so I'm going to have to be real careful if I try to shoot any video today. We're going to get any real good footage today with the, the wind is blowing. It's 
to see. I don't know. In fact, it's hopeless to be shooting video out here. The wind is blowing me away. By the way, next year we're going to have an all new shop. We are already in the planning stages of building an extension on the garage so that all our video will be shot indoors under controlled conditions. You know, this is relatively thick. I'm going to show this. See how this is going on at 50% at thinner? It's relatively thick. Let's see if we can candle it. Relatively thick. See where the spray ends? It's overspray. But for the first coat, I want to get the first coat on this way. Let it stay nice and thick because I don't want to have any chance of melting anything. Always try to get a little bit extra on the inclines, any incline areas, all the edges. Actually, it turned out to be a better day than I thought. It doesn't look like we're going to have any humidity problem at all, but if we were, I would just wait for another day. Now, see how it's on nice and thick, not too much thinner. Don't want to take any chance of anything melting here. And for a first coat, that'll be what we want to get on the plane, right there. Well, it looks like everything's drying up without fogging up. We've let this go even more than a half hour just to make sure, so well, I'm going to take a chance, shoot the mainframe. It's going to be impossible to shoot video out there. I'm going to have to do this in the garage. Thoughts are, anytime you're doing the first coat, get extra over the inclines, over the canopy, over any of the detailing. And try to get that first coat on not too wet. You try not to get a run. If you get a run in the first coat, it mars the color. If you get a run in the second or third coat, it'll probably go away very easily. Now this is our base coat, first coat of clear, drying up. A couple of the things I always look for to see if anything is starting to get loose in the fillets, if there's any spots right now, it would be very easy to poke them with a number 11 blade, keep pressing them down, even drop a little CA in there if you have terrible bubbles. These look like, well, they look fine right now. First coat of clear, I try to get a little extra overall of detailing and get it now. I want to explain this thing about the heating vent. We have a heating vent in this house, but this is a cellar. And it's usually pretty chilly down here. You can see most of the, almost all the time I'm wearing a flannel shirt. Now somebody, and I won't mention any names, wrote me a letter they had trouble that that dope is drying in about two minutes. They're putting it by a space heater. Well, a space heater is not this kind of a heater. And it's getting so hot that it's bubbling their paint up. Well, you don't want to force dry lacquer. Any lacquer that I know of, whether it's dope or whatever, you don't want to force dry it. In this case, the little parts I have sitting here, and I can just take any one at random. And see, now look at that first coat. It's kind of orange peely. It didn't really lay down nice and smooth. That's the way I want it. I want that first coat on there. None of the Letra sets moved or melted or anything. Cowling's starting to just let everything dry up. This is this is the hard part now, is what I'm going to try to do is get one coat on every day, maybe for a week. Six, seven coats, five coats. I don't know how many coats altogether, but for sure, I certainly don't want to rush this. And what happens if you put one coat on and another coat in a half hour and another coat in? Yeah, it'll dry out, but you run the risk that it's going to dry soft, you're going to trap thinner in there, and you'll be adding unnecessary weight. Now, in the, in the lifetime of this plane, which we hope is going to be, we always hope is going to be long, this week won't really matter. And I have so many other projects to work on, so every day, the first thing of the day, I'm going to come down, spray on a coat of clear. Each time I put another coat on, I'll add a little more thinner to the mix. I'm going to try to put on a little less than two quarts of clear in the whole thing. 
the whole amount of clay that will be on a plane. And for the sanding and buffing, two quarts will probably be plenty. Anyway, when I say, I, I don't want it to clarify that so nobody would lose a plane or have a problem. Heating vent is a great way to dry a plane, but nothing gets hot here. I mean, there's, just, there's almost no air coming out of there already. And for the first coat, the other thing I always check around the canopy, make sure you haven't softened the canopy at all in any way, especially if you're using one of the thin canopies. But some of them are really thin, you can, they're really prone to be melted. Anyway, we'll pick this up tomorrow morning, come down to shop and hope that this dried up real nice and get another coat right on top of it. Just a couple of finishing thoughts. No matter what product you're using, and some of these airplanes are done with acrylic lacquer, some are done with SIG dope, some are done with other products, and some are even Imran. But the, the basic thing that they all have in common is when you get to this point in the clear, this is one of the areas where I really like to, if possible, take my time. Now, if we were rushing to try to get this done, to run out to the Nationals next week or to Brodax meet or whatever, we might be able to justify, and in the, in, the, in the quickest of all worlds, maybe put a coat on in the morning, a coat on at night. But each coat, the more you can let each coat gas off, the, the easier it's going to be when it comes to sanding and buffing. You'll have that much of it out of the way. So I really think, no matter which material you use, and I'm prone to think Brodac dope is the best I've ever used, and everything I've done with it confirms that suspicion, but it doesn't matter if you're using other material. If you use an acrylic lacquer, for instance, letting it dry out well between coats is always a good idea. And the biggest thing I've learned, the biggest thing I've learned from all of the Brodac testing so far, if you stick with Brodac dope from the first time you put dope and thinner on the wood until it's all finished and it's buffed out and you don't go mixing and matching, you're going to have a real good chance at having a super finish without a lot of work. And the minute you introduce some unknown quantity into that, you start adding DuPont thinner or some other brand of thinner or mixing up some stuff. And I really, I had a real fit the other night. I was talking to somebody who, they used up the old paint they had from 10 years ago. They don't even remember what brand it is. Just pour them all on the same, and of course it didn't work. Now they don't know what to do. Gee whiz, I think I ruined my plane. No, I think you ruined it too, but stick with all one brand. If, if there's one lesson to learn, in the long run it'll be cheaper, your finishes will be better. You'll notice in my shop, that's all I have. And that's all I intend to use. This model has not one drop of any product that, it, that doesn't come from Brodac. And I think in the long run, the money, the time, the energy you save, it's the best investment of all in having a good time with the hobby. Now today what I want to do, before I would ever put a second coat on a plane, I always like to take and look at the whole plane very, very carefully. There are a couple of reasons. A lot of times the first coat that you put on, if it's thin, and in this case it looks like we've walked out, it'll melt ink lines, and I'm going to show a couple of spots, especially using white ink, where you'll, you'll melt the ink line. It looks like I have one spot here that I would need to touch up. In fact, I have one here. Usually it'll only happen on white ink. But the idea is not to get three coats of clear on the plane and then try to bury it. We want to bury that as, as down deep into the finish as we can. I also really like to check the canopy. Squeeze it, make sure I don't have any spots on here where it's melted or distorted. Because obviously if, say for instance, if there was a bad spot that was melting here, I'd want to do the repair or the replacement now, not after all the fur is on the plane. Again, I look around. Most of the time, any any time that you'll have a, have trouble with, it will be on the first coat of Letra sets. In this case, one of the nice things about using Brodac material, and again, I'm going to emphasize this because a lot of people have. This has been the quickest question I've asked. Can I mix this brand of thinner with this? And I have four quarts of this left over. And I get this every day. Every day I get this now. And. This airplane has not one drop of material that doesn't come from Brodac. It doesn't have last year's old finish that I didn't use up, some of Karen's stuff that she was using to refinish furniture. It's all new stuff. 
the total investment that I've made in material is far less up to this point, even to the end, than had I used other brands of material, even though I'd be using them up. You know, there's always people in a hobby. If you have a big inventory of old stuff and you're very convinced that this is the way you're going to want to finish planes in the future, take it and give it to one of the newer people in the hobby. Let them, it won't affect how they grow in the hobby, but it's going to hold you back if you get to this point in the plane and decide you're going to use up an old gallon of thinner that was sitting out in the garage and, oh, it, believe me, in the overall cost of building an airplane and the overall amount of time, and each one of us has a different value for our time, it is not a significant thing. The paint that's on the airplane is not a monumental thing like building a race car and you need a $25,000 engine or a Reno Air Racer. This is anybody that has any kind of a job should be able to afford new, crisp, clean material to work with. Really have to say that because that's one of the stumbling blocks. A lot of people, and I know they're gonna, I'm going to see them at the net and say, oh, I had this problem, oh, gee, I used this old stuff up here, and I had this sitting in a can, oh, gee, but, I, you know, oh, boy, I, I, I saved $5 by doing it. Yeah. Paint your lawnmower with that stuff. Anyway, the point that I want to make is I've invested up to this point probably two years and 600 hours in this airplane, and I don't want to compromise it now with anything, and I don't think anybody, even a person entering the hobby, would want to start learning how to do this in a way that made sense. Now, again, I always look, and I'll do this off camera in detail, I always look at every possible ink line, every fillet to see if I have a spot, a bubble that might be coming up. If there's a bubble, what I want to do, it's a spot where we're not getting good adhesion, is poked down with a brand new XL blade run some thin see I don't have a, a spot yet that I can I hope I don't have any that I can demonstrate that on it looks like the fillets are pretty solid again I like to look the plane over because I'm going to take out the white ink pen and I know there's <coughs> and I'll show these little spots if you use a little black ink you usually don't have that problem another thing you always want to do early on here is just by running your hand over this feeling if if there's any spots, say, where you put a ring or a little ding or something in it that you could touch up right now, because the idea is from this point on, we have about a quart and a half left of the clear, and I want to bury all of these ink lines and everything in clear. And as I'm spraying, I want to go over all the paint edges. In this case, where you have a blended edge, like on a camouflage, it's not really as important as if you have a dedicated paint line where it's a tape line. But even so, there's, there's about 25, I've figured out 25,832 rivets on this plane. And probably, I've rubbed my finger on a few that look a little, mm, I'll go there and I'll spend an hour, hour and a half, and I'll touch this up. Again, get it under a fluorescent light. Another thing whenever you're doing any of this work, under fluorescent lights, even if you have to take your shop, make where your workbench is, take incandescent bulbs out and put fluorescent bulbs in. So important to have fluorescent light, it shows mistakes. And in this case, what I'm looking for is the mistakes. Because anything that's, that's still a mistake now, I don't want to bury in clear. I want to have it right away that I can find it, correct it, and then put it right back. But so far, using this material, as, and I have used every brand of lacquer finish, every brand, every possible acrylic thing, Imran, Ditzler, you name it. Nothing that I've ever used is easier to get to this point. This is, I feel, in my case, the way I finish a plane, and there's no secret how I do it, obviously, I feel that right now I've spent about roughly half the time on this model up to this point as I've spent on either one of those other two Spitfires. Half of that time. I mean, this stuff, so far, this is what's really make me crazy. Is what's hold, The only thing that's held up this whole model is the weather, is that finding some days where we don't have a hurricane or some paint. But anyway, up to this point, now today I'm going to correct all the little errors and I'll show them. I'm going to put one coat of clear on today. Again, this first can see, even with one coat, even with one coat of clear. Now imagine you're an entry-level person. You've got a relatively nice finish on here with even one coat of this material. I mean, there's, there's less than less than two gun loads of clear on here now, and look at it. It's already got a little bit of a shine, some shine anyway. But here's the problem that 
if you want to be ultra fussy, usually it's your, your white ink that'll do this. You gotta you blood through that first that first line. So I need to go and if you don't have white ink, you probably won't have my, many problems. Electro sets, all the little electro sets, all the little ink line detailing seems to be just perfect. No problem around the canopy so far. And usually from this point on, you would add a little bit of thinner to each coat. That looks fine. Up around the front where it has all the wraparound detailing, that looks fine. Again, inspecting the plane right now around the Philip. Look to see if you've got any spot that's loose. It's easier to tack it down right now. And even even with one coat of clear, if you were looking to build the world's lightest stunt ship, and I know a lot of people are caught up in making planes ultra light. I, I think you could get this finish into the, the 17 or 18 point row without any problem at all. Anyway, I'm going to go touch up those ink lines and get another coat of clear on this today. Two things I keep from this point to the point that all the clear is on the plane. Two things I keep handy. I keep my pens right out on top of the table. Usually it's the white one that I always have to work with. And I also keep my little touch-up kit because as time goes by, I may see a little spot with a little spot over. And if you do it on an ongoing basis, you never wind up at the end of it where, oh, gee, why didn't I fix that? Why didn't I fix that? And when you can hand somebody a plane and appearance judging and they look around for six, eight minutes and they can't find a mistake, you know you've slipped one by them. You know they probably, <laughs> if you give them another minute, they'll probably find ten mistakes. Anyway, I want to get out one black pen, one white ink pen. Again, we did a, before this, if you haven't seen it, a whole video on doing ink lines extensively. But you'll always wind up on that first coat of clear that I always find there's always a few little spots that just seem to fade away from the thinner probably. And I'll touch those up now. And it looks like we got a nice day for spraying today. One of the keys I find to just getting the plane as flawless as you possibly can is always having these. I have the brushes and a touch-up kit with one little jar of each color that's on the plane. So I'm not prone to say, oh, oh, just let it go, let it go, let it go. I'm prone to touch up as I go along. And if you do it on an ongoing basis, by the time you get to that sixth or seventh coat, usually the plane will have the minimum of five coats, but sometimes six or seven. Again, how it'll depend on how thin those last two or three coats get. Now on this side, there's a little spot here. It'll usually be the high spots. Always very easy to touch up. If the ink doesn't seem to want to stick, take a Q-tip and some talcum powder, just rub it over that area, or some Sickens M600. That'll usually get the ink to stick right down. these are short areas, I don't even really have to take the ruler down. If I was doing the whole line, I'd want to take the ruler in place. Now it looks like we've walked out and the ink is sticking, but there's times that it won't. It doesn't, the white ink is really rough to use. Find an area that's really fussy. This is, and I've got an area on the other wing that, but for some reason, it must be a fingerprint or something there. Just take some talcum powder, put it in a Q-tip. Make sure there's no extra on there. This is the roughest one so far. This, I'm sure, has a little fingerprint, a little area of contamination. Just burnish it, take the clean side of the Q-tip, wipe off all the extra. M600 is okay, but you, you don't, I don't really, at this point, don't like to put M600 around ink. It kind of melts ink, though. And obviously, from this point on, I try to keep my hands as clean as possible, even though that's really impossible. Working with epoxy all day long. And the ink sticks right down, perfect. That's a, again, a Frank McMillan trick. I don't know if he invented it or passed it on, but I certainly, certainly credit him with that. And that is an excellent, excellent little tip. We've got another one over here. 
Because everybody thinks you just get on and, and spray the clear and then you're done. Well, yeah. But if you're really shooting for that museum quality work, which I know a lot of people are. A lot of people are just not looking for that rush off to the field thing. And in our case up here, I mean, yeah, winter is still with us. Even if I was finished this afternoon, it wouldn't matter. You can't go flying. But the white ink really adds, when you see a plane with white ink, see a hundred planes with black ink and you see one plane with white ink, wow, to me it really stands out and it makes the plane stand out in a crowd like nothing else. funny saying George used to tell me. His father was a mason. He said, some days the bricks talk to you and some days they don't. Whoops. Oh, lucky I didn't wish it there. Maybe I should be taping this down. Anyway, all this little touch-up ultimately does pay off. With all the touch-ups done, the first thing I want to do is go over and get one of the parts, a little test part, do my half hour test every day. And because we're in a time of the year, the humidity can rise or change right in the middle of a day. Now, even though it was only 60% this morning, the general rule is above 70% you need retarder. Above about 80 or 90%, you'll wait for another day. But anyway, at 60%, I'm still not safe that we're not gonna secure. I see I have a relatively rough finish on that. Now, when I put a little more thinner in the mix, and again, that'll probably be about another 10% thinner. Just rough. I want to see if I'm going to get a smoother flow out, and then I can back the pressure down just a little bit. Each coat, I can back the pressure down maybe two or three pounds, put a little more thinner in, and each coat will lay down flatter and flatter and flatter, and just saving the ultimate buff out of the plane, saving the sanding and buffing of the ultimate plane. But even at this, a lot of, a lot of people don't really, a lot of... Yeah, a lot of people spray other materials and they dry like sandpaper. It's terrible. I mean, this is not real. Even if you left this and just went out to the field to fly, you probably wouldn't have the worst, once you wipe that off a few times and got some wax on it, that isn't even so bad. But we want to do a full finish on this model. We're anticipating, uh, you know, a whole week of spraying a coat every day is just a rough number. And a little less than two quarts of material total. Toward the end, it'll be about 70% thinner tempting it may be to just go spray the whole model. In this case, it looks like we're going to have, a, it's going to get a little bit warmer today. But. Each coat as you start to lay it out, let me just show this, each coat as you lay it out, it'll just start to lay down nicer and nicer. You can candle it. candle, look for that reflection. And now we're going to let this sit a half an hour. If it doesn't fog over, we're just going to go right through the parts of the plane. Try to even get the mainframe out here and paint it out on the table if we can. It really looks like we've hit a lucky day here. Where I can tell you that the weather has been so bad. And that looks real, real nice. And this will be the second coat. In each coat, by adding just a little bit of thinner to it, each coat will just get progressively smoother and smoother. You can see the wind is kicked up. In two minutes, the whole thing changes. That's roughly what we're looking for here. And even that, if you left that on a plane, that probably wouldn't be so bad either. Anyway, even from the first coat to the second coat, you can see the better flow out, a little bit of extra thinning in. Boy, the big thing that makes this possible is the Brodac thinner. 
starting to pop. They're already starting to get a nice gloss. Again, remember a big part of what makes this possible is the thinner. And now, the wind is coming up, the sun is coming out, the whole day is changing. So I'm really glad we did that. That test was just a safety factor, and I'd always rather be safe than sorry. And no matter how you do it, you always want to get extra along the edges. You want to get extra over wherever there's a paint line, a definition line. By the time we get to the third and fourth coat, this material will just be laying down like it's a like a puppy waiting to go out the hole for a walk here. Yeah. There comes the wind again, quick. Just can't catch a break here. get some footage out here. I'm not, I don't know if we're going to have any luck. Let's just see what kind of luck we're going to have here. This is the time when you really wish, I wish I had a helper. Nobody's available today, so I'm just going to have to tough it out. Again, I'm trying to spray by candling, always looking down. Letting the light see my mirror. And we're supposed to get snow this week, so I just hope this whole week isn't going to turn into a waste of time. I'm really itching to get this going. A little bit extra over those inclines that we touched up. Well, that stuff blowing, man. The reason I'm doing this is I'm stopping on the incline a little bit past it, then I'm going to go back up over that main incline. So that'll have an extra coat. A little bit extra on the round bells. At this point on, I can start putting a little bit extra on it.
this is why we're, we're already putting money aside for next year to build ourselves an extension on that garage so we can be doing all our finishing in a controlled environment with heat lamps, professional finishing, making it available to all the people in the area. Here comes the wind. Come on. Don't you dare blow away. What I have had to blow away. The sidewinder blew off the table and didn't get hurt. Look at this. This is blowing up now. going up to that main incline and then when I go from the front I can go up to it also. It'll give a little bit extra which is what I'm looking for. Now if we were painting in a controlled garage environment with heat lamps, a dehumidifier, I guarantee you we'd be able to do this in you know, a third the time. But around here you're always waiting for weather. You're always waiting. Anytime you can, you can get a little extra on the ribs, of course. Ooh, that wind is coming now. place where I have a, a pain edge, I'll try to get a little extra. And certainly up around the shock mount, a little bit extra. I learned over the years is you never, never walk away from the airplane on a day when the wind is up and down, up and down. And even at this, it's basically, I really wish I had somebody here. One more year, we would be in a professional controlled environment. So I'm going to need that amount of space to do my epoxy work that's growing every day, the shop work. And so as long as I'm going to set up a dedicated part of the building, we will have a spray booth at last, free at last. Never walk away from the plane. Famous last word. Ask John DeTavio. You ever want to hear the funny sidewinder story? Ask John DeTavio. He was standing right there. Plane blew over. Not a scratch. It luckily had the landing gear wires in it. Landed right on the landing gear. I thought I couldn't do that again. A thousand times have I tried to do it. Now because the Brodak colors all have extra pigment, what happens is they tend to dry a little bit on the dull side and as soon as you put the clear on they they change a little bit, they I call it, they pop. They get a little shinier. And in this case the blue, and this is right out of the jar, this is not altered at all. This really is a nice color. It's a nice color for a cardinal. Get a little bit extra anywhere there's a paint line. Here comes the wind. Don't you dare. Down here it'll always be soaked with oil. That's a good place to get a little extra. Sit. Now that 
trick is to just babysit, sit out here for half an hour before I can flip it over and do the other side. Any spot that looks dry, where you can see the wind, look at the wind blowing around here. This is, this is the, the kind of luck I always have. And we'll just sit out here, keep an eye on it. Figures by the time the bottom's dried up and I'm ready to paint the bottom, it's getting cold. They predict it's snow, it turns from being a, what was a nice sunny day, and it's gotten cold. Now the thing I'm a little, a little skeptical of here is just how cold it is. It's showing that it's 40 degrees, but it feels a lot colder than that. And I want to get this, as soon as I paint it, I want to get it inside the house to dry. But even at 40 degrees, even when it's cold, the material really lays down nice. what's happening because it's cold. It really should be cleaning the gun more. Now if it gets any colder than this, I'm going to have to add a little bit of thinner, I think. Again, if you know the basic rules, it gets cold, you know, you want to Definitely, it's going to take longer to dry. Be aware of that. You walk out humidity-wise, but you never know. It could snow tomorrow. It could rain. Let's see what's happening. You had that clogging up, clogging up the tip of the gun from. It's just getting too cold out here, is what that is. When I go back inside, I'll add a little bit more thinner to this mix. This afternoon, when it was nice and warm out, everything was so nice. But you know what? It doesn't last forever. All I'm trying to do is go back over the cap strip areas, rib areas, any areas that are going to take a beating, any ink lines. Always a good idea to put a little extra paint on the top. You'll always wind up waxing it off and rubbing it out. I always wind up with more paint on the top than the bottom anyway. It's already starting to build up a nice shine. In the next couple of coats, this will really start to level out, flatten out, gloss out. Right now, I'm just hoping it doesn't snow. Anyway, I'm going to get this down inside the house where it's nice and warm and let it snow. better than while it's this temperature outside just getting this sucker up by a heating vent. We'll come down tomorrow. I hope it's not going to snow or rain. We can hope for the best, but with two coats on there, letting each coat dry out like this is really a big help. And you find out each coat, as you add thinner to it, little by little by little, it just lays down a little bit nicer. We'll eventually work our way up to the point probably where it'll be two thinners to one dope. But little by little is the way to do this. The shine looks real nice. Real nice the way this is laying down very early in on this. Anyway, we come back.
back and work on this tomorrow. like to take one extra look at it before I quit for the night. Now you can see today we're not even going to give it a try. I have other work to do in the shop, and I decided rather than even take a chance, when I know the humidity is way over 90%, and then what would happen now if I, if I go and add retarder to my mix, and it doesn't work, that means the next day I have to use up that mix that has the retarder, and I don't want to do that either, so what I'm going to do is just skip today. Today's a good day to skip. Never paint on a day when it's tentative. I tell you, that's been sitting up by a heating vent for two days. We're, we're right in the middle of a real, supposed to snow, but it rains every day anyway. But what will give me a little time here, I want to run a little explanation of, in, in applying the clear, what some of my little tricks that have worked for me over the years are. And any time you can let a plane just sit for a day and dry, even though Brodac Dope is a lot better than other products, an extra drying day is not going to hurt. Here's some thoughts on what I what I feel most people don't understand about putting clear coats on. Let's say you have also wood substrate, just for the sake of argument, and you have your your filler coats in silver, and they're perfectly smooth right now. So this this is a real nice, smooth, shiny, and that most of the time will be the case. But now what happens? You have your trim. And let's say you've done it the way I do it, that there's no double paint on the plane, or very little. And your trim colors, you've back masked, and now your trim is like so. So what this means is, this this will always have a little bit of a ridge one way or another. There's, there's almost no way I can ever figure out how to, even if you knock it down, that it's going to be perfect. There's a ridge. So now the first coat of clear is going to go over this. Let's exaggerate. Second coat is going to go over it. It's going to get each coat is going to get to be a little less. If you ultimately put on a hundred coats of clear, what's going to happen is this the line will probably disappear, but by then the plane will be too heavy. So what we need to do is at some point in the finish, sand these edges down, block sand, so that so that in effect we're it's almost like coal mining here. That we're knocking some of this ridge down so that the ultimate final surface is smooth. Now we want to do that s at some point before we actually put the rest of the clear on. Now we've got, I'm guessing, I'm guessing right now we've got at least half of the clear that we're going to put on the plane on it. But we want to get rid of a lot of these little mountain lines where it's changed. Now it's even worse if, if you can envision this. It's even worse in a plane where here's the substrate, and you've painted, let's say this is the color. You have to figure out the three-dimensional side of this. Here is, let's say you've painted it red, and by the way, that's one of the things you never want to do is paint red under anything. Red is always the last color to go on. Red will bleed through every color except black. And then you put your trim on. Well now, if you just look at this step here, how many times are you going to, this is going to need eight to ten times the amount of shaving and sanding to bring it back down. So if you have this idea in mind of what we're trying to do here is, is eliminate, and of course it eliminates when you don't have any of these, these mountains, but in the worst of all worlds where you've put one color right on top of another and one, one color has to actually be buried in the thickness, you're actually wasting this amount of material is going on the plane for the ride. 
this amount of material is going on the plane for a ride. So you can start to see that you're adding, and this is why a lot of people have these finishes that go 8, 10, 12, 15 ounces. They, they have extra. This is the whole reason why I detailed out why I try never to put more than two layers of color paint, one color, max if possible everywhere, even on the things like the round bells. Because what's going to happen now at this point, these, these lines are going to shave down a lot easier than if we had used this method. Now just as a rough, a rough number here, if you start off the first coat, and this would be just a guess number. This would not be every part of the country is going to have a different method. But if you start never, and we've learned from one modeler, again, who contributed the information to us. He tried using Brodak dope with no thinner and it didn't work. Okay, we've eliminated that part out of it. If you do your first coat in a 50-50 mix, probably that'll spray at 30 pounds of pressure. That's just a rough guess, but but somewhere in that area. That's a real nice way to build up a lot of the material. And in the two coats that we've put on the plane, we really have three coats because I've gone over the high spots. We've basically used a little more thinner. The next coat, again, I might, in, in the worst of all worlds, I might start thinking this should be 45 dope, 55 thinner. And see, now with the thinner mix, maybe you could go down to 27 maybe down to 25 even. Now you could ultimately, at the third coat, you could go down to 40, 60 thinner. You see what's happening? Each coat, and as this lays out, now if you understand this, this, this is why a lot of people are in dread of buffing out an airplane because they, they have not followed this routine in an accurate way. What happens? This coat is going to go on, and I'm just going to exaggerate here, a little bit orange peely. We all know what the orange peel with a wing joint and a tail where a wing meets the fuselage. This rough 80 grit sandpaper, this will tend to do that. Okay? As you put more thinner in, each coat is going to start to lay down just a little bit more. Now, at the point we're at now, about at the third coat, we're at 40, 60, so this is starting to lay down pretty decent. At some point, though, we're going to have to sand it. And I like the choices are if you 600 sand it with 600 paper and M600, it'll go real quick. Probably a couple hours you'll have the whole model done. But it has a tendency, if you have a heavy hand, to leave scratches. And again, not everybody and not all the time. The other choice is zero, 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 zero steel wool. I've used that many times. That's an old timer's trick. It can tend to take a lot of material off and you can tend to go through. Sometimes, again, depending on your individual technique and how heavy handed you are. But my method, the method I like, and it's it's a little more time consuming, but you always get that really nice finish. It's 1200 sandpaper, seconds M600. Now what happened, Mike Costello tried to do it on his ballerina with Windex and he found out it wasn't really cutting the way it should. Soon as he went to M600 and 1200 paper, done. 1,200 sandpaper, and you might even try 1,000 if you really want to be a, a real experimenter, but I really, I always wind up using 1,200 sandpaper. This, this, no scratches. It takes a long time. The advantage of doing it this way is there's no scratches. So you pay a time penalty here, but now, the reason is, the reason I don't like to have any scratches is at this point in time to finish if I have scratches, it's going to look like this. Or I'm going to have a tendency to go through where an incline is popping up or something and I've sanded through and that's always going to happen. And now I want to have a certain amount of the clear left for maybe coats four, five, and six. And I'm thinking six might be as many as we need. But these coats, this is going to be relatively, let's say 40% 60% thinner, roughly, and, and then maybe in the next coat, this will be 35. I wouldn't want to go a whole lot more than that. 
each one, in fact, Bob Gildini has told me that years ago what he used to do, and I, I have never done it, I'm not going to, but you could ask Bob, is the last coat he would just spray a coat of straight thinner over the model to flatten it down. Well, we may try that on Kajeski's plane, I don't know. But anyway, this is, if, if you follow this little routine, and it isn't that complicated, if you understand what's trying to happen, we have a rough surface, we're trying to smooth it out, we're, each time we work it or spray it, we're trying to get it flatter and flatter. So that ultimately, the ultimate situation is that we have this dead flat surface that's not very thick and all the light is going to get bounced off. Light gets bounced off a mirror, a shiny surface. It's why a diamond reflects light. It holds a flat shine. And we're looking for that flat surface. If this surface looks like this, it's not going to bounce a lot of light off. So I hope this little, just these little thoughts, this will give you some idea of what we're trying to accomplish. It's really not that complicated. With, with all, all these kind of things, there's two possibilities when you're doing anything in model aviation. Something is very complex and you need a lot of technology to figure out how to do it. And one case of that would be to, to get a motor to run perfectly. There's a lot of variables. It's technology that you're after. In, in finishing, there's very little technology and a lot of labor. This is usually just labor, 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 labor. And if you have the patience and the time, you'll wind up right in the front row with all the top level guys that are really, you know, pay, I call it paying the price. There's just no other way to say it, paying the price. I'll do today. This has been dry in two days. And you can see it still has the roughness from the first coats having not enough thinner in it, but it really sealed the ink lines up nice. So what I want to do, I want to take a little test piece, take my 1200 sandpaper, some Sickens M600, and see how easily this blocks down. Now, if you run into a situation, at this point in time you really cannot dry sand the plane without using up a thousand sheets of sandpaper, but if you were really looking to save time, 600 sandpaper, the only downside would be that you'd probably leave some sanding scratches. And this already has what I feel is a really nice little gloss. You probably, I mean, in the worst of all worlds, could take some gorms and even buff this out. But what I want to do now, be, because I, I'm really striving for perfection here, at least in my, within the limits that I have, I want to block sand everything down as flat as possible. If I go through an incline, the minute I see I've hit an incline, I have to stop, touch up the incline, or the Letra set, or whatever, and go out and shoot a little extra clear on it. Nothing bad has happened. I've gotten all the mountaintops down. If you skip this step or try to move on, well, you'll just wind up adding more and more clear to the plane, and at some point in time, it's going to get too heavy. But maybe, maybe at this point in time, if you had a, a choice, and you wanted to let the plane dry for a week, it would speed up the sanding. But in this case, this material, in my past experience, was ready to sand the next day. And I'm interesting. Now it's dry in two days. We'll see how it sands. It still has a relatively nice gloss, even with only, only really two coats of clear on that. I just wanted to, just as a demonstration, this is not what I'm going to do, but as a demonstration of what some of the choices are. Here's our piece. This is 600. Okay, just want to verify that we're not making a problem. This is, if you were to try to sand it dry, you would get most of the mountain tops off and it certainly wouldn't hurt anything. Okay, but at some point, obviously, you're going to hit an ink line or hit a paint edge or something. So what happens is, you can see it's powdering up. It's really not sanding as efficiently as I would like. This is a little too time consuming for my taste, but it is powdering off and that's all that really matters is that you're getting powder, you're not getting chewing gum. Let's lay this down here and you can... The 600 has a tendency to clog up too, which I don't like when you do it dry. But now watch what happens when we sand wet. One of the original ways that Harold Price used to show me how to do it was a little bit of dishwater, 
soapy water, that'll work fine. In this case, Windex will work, but nothing works better than M600. Sickens M600, always use, even if you use Windex, anything you do in relation to finishing, use good ventilation, of course. And if you're not shooting video, it's pretty easy just to wear that mask, that Wilson mask, a good quality mask. Okay, now just to show you the difference, first hand, let me dry this off. Get a look at the part that we sanded wet has almost no mountain tops. This part here. So what what this does, and you can see it just there's nothing stays in the sandpaper this way. Windex is an okay way. If you really don't have access to M600, Windex would be one way. Soapy water would be one way. But if you're using anything water-based, you want to have the smallest amount of water touching the model ever possible. You don't want a lot of water. The minimum amount of water. Wait the minute you're done, wipe it dry. Now we're getting down there. You can see there's just a few little... This area is ready. Got a few little low spots, and this is from spraying those first couple coats dry. Nothing bad about this. Believe me, nothing bad. And I just want to do this each way, because I know there's some people that are not going to have gallons of M600 available, or for whatever reason, they'll prefer this way. This way doesn't ruin your hands. If you have office worker hands, you won't have to worry about uh, having to go for a manicure or anything. And again, if we were to let this dry out an extra week or so, that'll make it a little bit easier, but the only downside to using the M600, the, the 600 paper instead of 1200, is you get those little tiny scratches, which can be a pain. Now we're coming up on having it here, and that's right here, you have it, right in the middle here. Well, I just took a little piece even though we're not going to buff the plane out yet, obviously we're going to put more clear on it, but I wanted to show you that, because this is, this is one of the things that probably people looking to really upgrade their skills are going to want to know, and it's hard to figure this out unless you've done hundreds and hundreds of these jobs. And here it comes. I see it's starting to buff out. Even 600, even though we've done this with Windex and 600, just look at, you see the sanding scratches? You see those little scratches in there? That'll make you crazy, those little scratches. Now this is Sickens M600, this is 1200 paper. And I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes. Because if you're not concerned with those little sanding scratches, the 600 will be fine. But if I take this, and I can go right over it. By the way, you buy Sickens M600, in body shop supply houses. I don't sell it. The shipping on it would be prohibitive. Any big city has a body shop supply house. 1200 sandpaper. Same thing. I sell the sandpaper if you can't find it locally, and it's just a service. Now, the 1200 will leave everything really, really nice and flat. see the difference with this is you'll get out even if you've done a 600 sand out you'll get rid of the scratches you see how nice and flat that is take some grooms and boy this is the material not to be substituted I haven't found anything else that'll make a finish pop up any even close all of these car waxes and stuff to $30 a jar not even close. Whoop. Look at this, it just flew across the room. You can tell we don't edit anything out, but you can see that's starting to come up already. And if you see this, you can do a little test piece. Practice on, obviously practice on the bottom of the plane first. Now this is only two day old dope, don't forget. You put final shine on top of this, it's like a mirror. 
There it is. Now, I hope this is going to give you some idea. Now, you know, we could obviously quit right now and go buff out the plane. That would, <laughs> There's no problem. But I want to have extra clear on here because what's going to happen, I'm going to wind up in the, in the span of eight or ten years that I hope this model will last, I like to just before the Nats each year, or if I fly this plane at some big contest or show, rebuff the plane out, just hit it with Gorms, hit it with Final Shine, and it always takes a little bit of pain off, a little bit of pain off, a little bit of pain off. So by having a little bit extra on, this gives me that choice of like a ten-year finish. Anyway, I would think for two-day-old dope finish, I, and no scratches, that's, that's without even having Final Shine on it. And I don't see any reason anybody can't do that. There's no secret to that that isn't on this set of four tapes. I'm sanding out all these little parts, you'll see. There's always little spots you go through. That's because you don't, you don't have all of the clear on here. But the reason I like to get as much of this taken care of as I can right now is what will happen is later on we'll get just like a saran wrap coat of clear, the next two or three coats, maybe two coats, maybe they'll be swift. I'm not going over those little glitches, so they'll tend not to come out in the next sand out. You can see here I've sanded through an incline a little bit, well that's got to be corrected. This is where you always have your little touch-up kit around, that needs to be touched up. A couple little spots, usually it'll be by an incline. Little spots maybe over here I want to touch up to it. What'll happen, by touching them all up now, then they get buried in that nice, final, smooth coat of clear at the very end. And this is the part of the, the job you just have to really be fussy. I know it's tempting now. If, whoops, there goes some ink. If you were, if you were trying to use, or if you were going to leave out this step would be a good way of doing it. If you're going to leave out the step of sanding out some of the clear and wait to the very end, what will happen is you'll add a lot of weight because by doing this sand out, I'm taking, well, some of the clear that I've already put on the plane off. So you want to, you'd certainly want to think about using less clear if you weren't going to use this, do this sand out deal. this does it gives that final coat or final couple of coats we're going over absolutely no mountaintops no imperfections nothing that's going to cause a problem in the final finish the trick anywhere you sand through any black paint and you need to do a little touch up ink is a good way to touch up and that was an old Glenn Meadow trick he always used to make the planes black, and then when you sand it through, all you need to do is hit it with ink, and ink is relatively flat, so you don't get, you don't need to have that, that big mountain there. Okay, we'll touch up on that part is done. Having that touch up kit out one by one as you have to touch up the coat. If you have a little touch up kit, boy, it just makes this step so much easier. And a couple of pens, we're ready to do any incline touch ups because if you sand the right amount off, you're going to go through in spots. If you don't go through, you probably didn't sand enough. I guess that's a good way to put it. Now this step also removes a lot of material, so in the final analysis of getting the weight down, we're taking a lot of material off the plane this way. And if, again, you have to kind of fine tune this to your own way of doing things. If you weren't going to do this step, maybe you only want to put one coat of clear on the total plane, but if you're going to put two, you better sand a lot off and it better be that you're touching up as you go or else that final coat, and that is the so important to understand, it's that final coat it doesn't want to go up over any mountaintops. It just wants to go on like, just like covering a whole plane with a piece of saran wrap, kind of like that. Now after the next coat of clear, you can see how nice that lays down, where it doesn't take long with this material.
These, once those coats have the little extra thinner in them, it really lays down nice. Now, I just wanted to show this up on tape. Real bravely, I went outside to show you how critical this is. Tried to put a coat of clear on the part, the next part that I sanded down, throw another coat of clear on, and it's starting to fog up. So what it means is we're right on the razor edge of having to add retarder, and I really don't want to add retarder. So what I'm going to do is just spend the rest of the day sanding the parts out and wait for a real, real dry day. We've been in the middle of... These are the kind of things that you try to rush it, and then a week later you're sorry. You can see it's just starting to fog up. Not bad. If we were in a rush to get to the Nationals tomorrow morning, we, you know, we could just put some retarder in the paint and this would go away. But I'd rather, given the fact I got so much time into this plant, I'd just rather, when you see any kind of fogging on your little parts, you know you're not going to do a lot of painting that day. And in this case, to get that fogging off tomorrow, I'll just hit this with some 1200 paper and put a coat on here. And if it, if it still doesn't go away, put a little bit of retarder in that usually we just releases the moisture that's in there, but you sure as heck, when you see that little fogging, you don't want to go ahead under any and shoot the main frame of the plane and have the whole plane fog up. I remember one of Mike Dietrich's beautiful I beam, either Argus's or Cobra's, whatever it was. Mike had a beautiful black plane, and when black fogs up, you couldn't believe it. I'm sure he was ready to. <laughs> I don't even want to say it on camera. But I remember that, and I remember thinking, geez, if you just waited another couple of days, you know, sometimes you have to live to fight another day, and that's the case today. Always a good idea, no matter what, to have a four-ounce jar of retarder around in case you get halfway through a day like this and it starts fogging up. You may want to think about not doing it, but... This will just at least just get you through the day. But again, you really don't want to depend on it. I really like to, on something I have this much time in, whenever it's suspect, better just to wait another day. As always, the better of two choices. Live to fight another day. Okay, today our major thrust is going to be to start sanding out the mainframe. I got all the little parts done yesterday. Again, another rainy day, so... Not much is going to get done in terms of spray, and I wouldn't even bother doing the test. Well, one of my thoughts is, normally I would sand the bottom of the plane first, but what I want to do is I want to leave the ring go to very last. That'll give the, the ring a little extra time, probably an extra day or so to, for the dope to harden up. So what I'll probably do is wind up starting with the top of the tail, Maybe working my way forward on the fuselage, doing the nose section. I'm trying to lay this out in my mind and leave any of the tissue areas. Any, if you were doing a D-tube, an open bay wing, leave that kind of for the last thing. Anyway, you can see this is really dried up nicely. And I assume we're just letting it dry an extra day or so is going to be in our favor. It, it there certainly isn't going to hurt anything. And then we'll get as soon as we can, as soon as we can get it to stop raining. No. You know, the weather is something you just had around here this time of year, no control over. And we'll see how this is going to sand out now. It's now, this is going to be the third day, so even an extra day or so, it helps. Now, what I'm really trying to do here is just knock down all the paint edges, high spots. I'm not looking to make a major project out of this. And again, I always try to save the open bays or silk span areas for last. This is the kind of thing you may want to practice on the bottom. The reason I'm doing the top is I wanted to show this. When you use an M600 on the mainframe, and this is a good tip, you want to do as much of the sanding as you can. M600 is really the right material for this kind of a sand out. And what you want to do is, as soon as you clean the excess off, you want to make sure you get underneath. You don't leave any, any that rolls around the bottom can be a problem. It can be kind of a nuisance. It forms little, uh, like, hard jello lumps. Mm -hmm. 
Now, once it's dulled out, you can see the little specks. This is a piece of pre-dried clear that's spit out of the gun. This is seamed right out. But what I'm looking for is right about here, just just that amount. And I, as soon as you go through an incline, obviously you have to quit. I need to get one of those little rubber tadpoles to get in the fillets. Or if you're using wider fillets, you need a, a little mandrel or a little rubber squeegee that's the shape of the fillet. Or you'd probably use your fingertip, even though I don't like that way. But that's what I'm striving for on the whole. That'll be the wooden part of the plane. And probably by the end of the day or tomorrow, I'll start on the wing panels. And you'll notice any dope finish, when it's sanded out like this, it's smooth as glass. But the next coat that goes on just lays right on beautifully. The trick is to get it all blocked out dull like this and going through in as few spots as possible. This is the little, the little, these are hard rubber. They go to the Porter Cable tool. But I know you can buy these in body shop supply houses. They're called polywogs, tadpoles, frogs, something. I'm not sure of it. Little hard rubber things that, for getting in little fillet areas, there's no way a human that, that I know, who human would it, can get your finger in there. And if you want to, yeah, obviously what I'm trying to do is clean that edge and make it as crisp as possible. And if you think this is easier than doing fillets, give it, give it a try and see how hard it is to keep this edge really nice. It's really difficult, but it really does look crisp in the final product. And obviously there's areas like this where you need the little rubber tool. Now with the fusage and canopy gun, and I'm just checking for little flaws as I go along. Anything left, and I'll probably get to, to finish this up tomorrow, is the wing. That'll give it one extra day to dry. Now today we're blessed with a, just a spectacular day. It must be 45 degrees outside here. Only one problem, we don't have the mainframe sanded out, but it'll be a good day to get the small parts that we have already done, get a coat of clear on. Now of course every day I do my little test with a part that is sanded, and I first thing I'll do is I'll start this, see if it dries foggy. Even though it's a beautiful day, I really don't have a a firm idea of what the humidity is until I paint a part. And again, we've been walking that narrow line the last week or so. Rain every day, potential rain. Days it's supposed to rain and it doesn't. It's supposed to snow and it rains, rain and it snows. But if you have this test and you let it dry a half an hour, you'll almost always be safe. get an idea how to, how to paint. As soon as you get a couple of coats on it, when you get that first sand out done, everything starts laying down real nice. So you can get an idea of what that should look like when you candle it. But you really, as you, after the first sand out, that paint should really start laying down on it. I've got a little extra thinner in it. Today, with the temperature the way it is, could probably even get away with putting a little more thinner in here. It really develops a nice gloss. And when you're spraying dope with a little bit extra thinner, it's a good idea to put two or three thin coats on, not try to load it on. Obviously, because the problem is you may you have a tendency to get a run. Well, I really wish we only had this relatively nice day. I wish I had the rest of that sanding done, but unfortunately I don't.
I always want to make sure I get is extra on all the edges from this point on. From this point on, those edges are very vulnerable to sanding through or buffing through, so a little extra right along the edges, always a good investment. And obviously what I'll do too is go ahead on an ongoing basis, if I, as I'm spraying these, if I see any little spot that needs touching up, I can stop, run in with the touch-up paint or the ink pen, touch it up. So easy to do on an ongoing basis instead of waiting. Okay, whatever time we have left in this session, I want to get this wing sanded out if possible. And that'll be really, really a major accomplishment. This is the point at which I get itchy and I want to try to finish it all in one session and you really can't. It took me a whole day to do the, the stab and the fuselage and the canopy. This is what's nice about having one of the midgley canopies, nice solid canopy. You can really grind away at it. But anyway, I'll take one panel at a time and real carefully work one section at a time. Not try to rush to it and never sand this way. Go to sanding and try to not sand the wood tops. Try to get everything in between. Okay, now these, <clears throat> this has been dry in three days, so it's pretty relatively easy to sand, but again, you got to keep the sandpaper off the cap strips. And when we get to the roundels, that's going to take just a little more time. Now, good news, if you have a foam wing, this part of the job takes a tenth at a time. A D-tube, you know, a fifth at a time, let's say, some amount of time less. But if you have an I-beam plane or you have a real, no, I don't know what to even say, a real need to have perfection, this part of it is going to take time. And unfortunately, even I can't rush right through it. But this is the part of the job that makes the plane light and extremely easy to buff out. Once you get rid of all these high spots, and obviously with 62 ribs, or how many ribs are in this wing, one rib at a time is the way to do this. And so you can see there's just a little bit of extra on these caps. That's what we put all that, and that Brodak primer that's on there, but it's worth its weight in gold. And just do that 62 more hundred. Well, we got one panel and a half a panel done. Again, I'm trying under no conditions to rush this through. I really want to make sure I don't push this, so I'll pick this up tomorrow. And maybe that's a good lesson to learn is these are the things that just take hour after hour of careful, patient sanding. And it's really hard to do in one sitting. I'll pick this up tomorrow. put in a whole day on sanding this out and I'm not really getting I'm not really getting the clear on here it's almost dark but you can get an idea of just what kind of finish is really starting to come up on this and it's gotten a little bit colder in the last oh geez I'm getting into an area of a little bit of high risk here I don't know why I should be waiting until tomorrow anyway it's starting to really look what like what all I-beam planes look like and that is, to me, very, very attractive. I love that look. Anyway, the only problem is it's it's already getting dark, it's already getting cold. And I'm hoping this is gonna dry up in about five, 10 minutes. I'll flip it over, give the top a coat, and leave it in the house overnight. And we'll have, well, I hope a couple days for it to dry before I can work on it again. Now there's one little spot that needed to be touched up here that I didn't notice in the original. I guess in my rush to get this done before it got dark. So obviously the trick is back mask. Try to end at an ink line. In this case it's in a little fillet area. Try to end at a, an ink line or some 
line, and that's one of the advantages of having ink lines. I just fogged in just a little bit of green. I let that dry overnight. Come back to this tomorrow, and I'll be ready for that guy. Ready for the next coat. Now today, I have all the little touch-up areas that I wanted to touch up done. But remember, what, what I said, and it's important to me anyway with the, the system that I use, I do the touching up on an ongoing basis, and there's always little spots. You'll always be walking along, you think, oh, there's a rivet that you sanded through, there's a little spot, a little spot where the fillet isn't just right, there's always something. So if you do that, again, on an ongoing basis, now we're, we're looking at the weather report says we're going to be in the, the 40 to 50 degree range today. When we can get another coat of clear on this, I just, this is already starting to shine up so nice, even before it's buffed. And I think, even for people who don't want to buff finishes, I think just having this level of finish on here, and, it, and it's so easy to do, it's not an undoable thing. This is really just standard Brodak dope finishing. And if we can get, I'm going to wait till we, usually again, the warmest part of the day in this, in our part of the country is maybe from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's when I like to do the painting if possible. If I have all the choices, I'm going to wait till that prime part of the day and try to get some spraying done on this. I'll do the little test first. Just looks like a gorgeous day out here. And we're going to get our little test done and then wait a half an hour, see if we're in a humidity problem. I don't think we will be. The only problem we're going to have is the wind today is howling. So the wind, I always try to arrange that I, here's what happens, and you may have a situation like this in, in your spray area. If, I, if, I, if the wind is blowing from this direction, I try to paint in that little recessed area. And today, I can't really tell which way the wind is blowing. It's just swirling all over the place. I'm going to try moving the bench out into that area, kind of use this door as a little bit of a protection. Wind is swirling. I think I have my best shot here. I have the protection of where the wind is really blowing. Now, in a case like this, just positioning where you want to shoot, and I try to do all my shooting outdoors if possible in the sun, it's real critical to find a spot where the wind is the least of a disadvantage as I can make it. Even though it's really warm, it's warm, 40 degrees. One of the things I, you never really can take for granted is that you're not going to have a humidity problem. Again, I'll do my half hour test. When I come back, it'll be after lunch time. I'll be in the warmest, the warmest, least humid part of the day is from 12 o'clock to about 2 o'clock around here. What I've got, I've got the pressure on these next coats back down to about 20 pounds. Extra thinner in, I'm almost at two thinners. For one, it's almost, almost, I would say, a pint of clear to a quarter thinner, very close to that amount anyway. You can see it's going on very thin at the low pressure. You have to go back and forth. But the advantage is it'll dry out with, with these nice thin coats. Ultimately, when it comes to sanding out and buffing, I'll save a lot of the work that normally would go in that step when you spray thick and heavy. Always want to get extra on the edges. All the little spots where the hinges are get sealed. Boy, that wind, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to paint out here. Now what I'll do is get the second coat right on, right over the first coat. And this temperature, this stuff will dry right up. Assuming it, doesn't, assuming it doesn't blow out of my hand. But if you add a little thinner to each coat, and I would say it maxes out at somewhere about two thinner to one dope with this product. But these last couple of coats should, should give us a nice blowout. The paint should lay down, require a minimum of sanding before we actually go ahead and do any of the buffing. And always good to look at your part, look for dry spots. Relative to other materials I've used, this is the easiest material to spray that I've ever seen. Oh, everybody that's been in my little spray seminars 
within five minutes is laying on this material just the way I've got it here. Almost no exceptions to that. Now we, of course, we'll give this the half hour to dry, and then if it's okay, we'll paint the rest of the parts. Okay, after moving this plane around about 40 different places in the yard to try to minimize the wind, let's see if I'm right. Let me get this. Again, I'm trying to work around having to deal with the wind here. Anyway, notice I'm doing the bottom first, as always. Trying to get any spot that normally doesn't get a good coat, edges. And from this point on, the mixture will probably be a very close to two parts thinner to one part open the bolt. We're down to spraying at about 20 psi. And in this temperature, which is probably about 45 degrees by now, it's supposed to go to 50. Again, you know how some other products you spray, they turn to 80 grit sandpaper right up around in here. This one doesn't. When you see that 80 grit sandpaper look, you know you've got too much pressure and not enough thinner. And from this, the look of this, we're not going to have to add any retarder to this at all. This is just going to lay right on there. Now, Mike Estella told me in his ultimate finish on the ballerina, he wound up on a small size plane putting a quart. We're going to put a quart and a pint as the ultimate amount of material. But again, a lot of it is going to get sanded off in the course of buffing and sanding. So you kind of have to figure your own your own amount somewhere between a quart if you're not going to buff to maybe a quart and a pint or maybe even two quarts if you want to be uh, the ultimate concourse finish. It's nice to see how well received the ballerina Brodak finish was at VSC and hear from so many other people that seem to be having exceptional good luck with the material. Let's hope we add your name to the list soon. I expect to see a lot, a lot of planes up in that front row. And let's hope these videos help people get over the little hurdles that can be in a finishing job. If you think of what finishing was years ago, the nightmare some finishing jobs all time consuming turned out to be, and how easy this stuff is to do now, it's unbelievable. It's not even the same thing. It's not even fair to call it the same situation. Anyway, we are going to get, I'm going to let this dry, may roughly a half an hour on this coat and then flip it over. Again, extra on all the edges. Again, you always use the sun to candle, if possible. Candle right off the sun. Here comes the wind. Look at this. I believe this. Just when I thought I had beat the system. Now, I think when you follow, well, the few little tips and tricks that are on this set of four videos, I hope that virtually everybody is going to have this kind of luck. This is, this is in my mind, this is as easy as it gets. It just doesn't get any easier. And if you were doing a foam wing plane without the ribs to worry about, this would go in a fraction of the time of any other finishing system I've ever used. As soon as that dries, we'll flip it over and do the top. All right, it's getting warm out here now. Woo! And the warmer it is, obviously, the nicer it is, and more pleasant it is to work out here. I want to get a little extra on this spot that I've touched up. Any spot you sand through, obviously, the first thing is touch it up. 
And by the way, it is a million times nicer in terms of workload to be able to paint when it's at least 70 degrees. We're sneaking up on 50 now, but it seems like we're in the Bahamas because of the crazy winter that we've had. And totally unpredictable weather. Again, what I hope you get off of the video is just some of the, the little tricks and tips that you can use so that we can get a lot of planes up in that front row and really have a appearance point shootout. No matter what kind of plane you like to build, having a nice finish on it, I can't think of many things that have kept me in a hobby longer than having these well-finished planes, planes that other people seem, seem to enjoy, seem to appreciate. And the nice thing about any concourse, judging, it's done by the pilots. I always find that to be a special thing. It's your own peers. Again, these colors out in the sun really, really have become a lot brighter than in the fluorescent lights down in the cellar. Really have jumped. And it was maximize the use of a, what, what looks like it's going to be an exceptional day. You don't get many days like this in the cooler months of the Northeast. This is an exceptional one. Again, there's just a lot of little tricks, tips, whatever you want to call them that go into. Maybe some of them you can pick up just watching somebody spray, anybody that's an accomplished sprayer. You can learn from them. And the biggest thing is once you learn, pass the stuff on. Invite some people over to your house for a little spray demo, give them some help. I mean, at some point in the hobby, everybody is going to, and I imagine it's going to happen sooner than people think, you're just going to have an awful lot of people in the next couple of years with some really, really high quality finishes. It's going to get harder and harder to separate the planes at the top. Maybe it's even hard now, I don't know. I want to get a little extra over that incline. Both of these models, I did a very, very careful study of how much material actually went on them, how much I took off, and I haven't done that yet with this material, because obviously it has to gas off. Now there's a couple of things from this point on. I have all of the clear, except for one gun load, that I'm going to put on these parts. And I always save that last gun load for, inevitably, you're going to go through on edges. When I sand this down before the buffing, there's little spots to be touched up everywhere. Yeah, it's a, I don't know a way of getting around that other than just putting on six extra quarts of clear. And we're certainly not going to do that. I, I don't want to even think about adding the, all that material. I think for this plane, we now have a quart and a pint and I haven't kept track of how much thinner, but the th whatever amount of thinner, doesn't matter, the thinner really mostly gases off. Here's another point, and maybe I forgot to put this on the video. When you're doing an I-beam plane, you spray this way one coat and this way the other coat, or else you build up more paint on one side of the rib base than the other. Obviously, same thing with a D-tube wing. I always try to spray standing here and shooting this way then shooting this way, then the next coat shoot from the outside in. And I think that contributes to some of the, some of the evenness of getting that last coat on. Otherwise, I've noticed that it's, you've, it's very prone to buff out on one side of the rib and go through. But that's why we keep that extra little bit, that extra gun load of paint. That's so important. It, unless you want to run the risk of adding more paint that you really don't, uh, I think it's unnecessary. This is what's left of our first, and I think it's just about a gun load, but I'm going to save this. I'm going to mark it, of course, 
that is the that is what's left of a quart and a pint of Brodac clear that went on the Spitfire. And maybe some of that will go back on there when I ultimately get down to the point where I'm sure I'm going to go through somewhere and I'm going to want to come out and touch it up. Usually you go through on edges, rib tops, maybe somewhere else where there's a high spot that you haven't addressed yet. But basically having that little bit of extra clear. Now, what I know from this point on too is, I know using other materials, I would typically put a gallon of material on. In this case, I'm putting on about one-third the amount of total clear in volume. So again, I'm going to see if a typical rate would be that before clear and after clear, usually we allow between two and a half to three ounces total. Usually you'll put on four ounces and sand an ounce and a half off in the buffing and sanding process. But again, when I'm all done with this, I'll look at my notebook and I'll pretty much have a gauge on what that amount of material added in terms of weight. And that's the, that's the information I'll be looking for. Now the biggest thing is I want to set this aside for a few days. I know I'm going to go through. So I keep my pens out. I keep my touch-up kit out. I'm going to keep the template. I know the reality of this is if I don't go through in a few spots, then I've probably got too much clear on the plane and I'm probably just carrying around an extra pint of clear that I don't need. And right now from looking at the way this is drying up, I, I really don't think we're going to need any more clear. I think and it's possible, it's possible that at the end of this video what I'll deduct from is that I only needed a quart. Maybe I've got too much on here already. But by keeping track of the weight, by keeping track of, it, it's, it's foolish to try to keep track of coats. Coats don't matter. It's how much you actually get on the plane because when you spray thin, a lot of it goes in the air. If you spray thick, a lot of it stays on a plane. If you don't sand any off, a lot of it stays on a plane. So I can only use, it's only relevant when I compare my own finishing system to finishing systems I've had with Imran and with acrylic lacquer and with different brands of dope. And I, it looks like, to me, my initial impression is that roughly a quart in, in a very careful scenario, a quart would be plenty, even on a big plane, and possibly even less. And again, those are the things we're going to know when we finish some of the other projects that we have around the shop. We'll know for sure just how much and how much weight it added. So we're going to put this aside to dry for a couple of days. And while it's drying, what I'm going to try to do is get it up by a heating vent. Now, I say heating vent. In this house, the heat down the cellar it never really gets warm, so I don't want to give somebody the false impression that possibly I'm putting this up by some kind of tremendous radiant heater or something. It's, it's just, if you can keep this where it's warm, you're going to be ahead of somebody who keeps it in a damp, cold cellar. Warm is the better of two scenarios. I always like to check around the cockpit because this is where it's prone. If you have a little problem, something that you want to address, this is going to be the focal point of the plane. I want to touch it up now, put some more clear on top of it, and let it sit. So far, it looks like most of the little flaws and little things that I needed to repair have been taken care of. And so far, the thing I'm really happy about here and that I didn't have with other products is that final coat of clear always used to be dull. It almost used to look like sandpaper sometimes. This, even if I were to take this out to the field right now, and this is dry to the touch, if I were to take this right out to the field tomorrow, this is probably a, a relatively nice finish. Another thing too is it's pointless to weigh this. The weight right after you paint something, the, the thinners have an outgas, so you get a false reading. You really need to Again, if you were the Nats, if the Nats were tomorrow, we would rush and try to get this done. But the reality is, we have about two months to go. So setting this aside for a week is a really good. I'm guessing it'll just make the sanding and everything real easy. And we have plenty of other projects we're working on here, so we're not under the gun. Set this aside for a week by a heat event, and we'll come back to it and sand it out and buff it out. Now it's a really, really uh, marginal day here, really overcast day, so I want to do my little test to see if my parts are going to fog up or not fog up. Now all during the last week, what I've been doing is one part per day, or two parts per day, I've been trying to see how hard the paint would be getting, so to, 
so I could estimate when the when the best time to buff this material out was. Now what I did, when I was buffing out the flap, you can see I buffed through a little corner here, and I'll, no problem there, just touching that up. But we've gone through about a week through the rating cycle, and this is this is an important thing to, assuming most people are going to buff the, the paint out, that we started with some of these parts one day, and they buffed up, but it was a little difficult. On the second or third day, it got noticeably easier, and from about the third day on, it got, now we're a week away, and the parts are just buffing up like they're butter. But, we do, we do have, whenever we have a little buff up like this, a little buff through, I like to do a touch up, and then hit that area with a little bit of clear. Now what happened here this morning, I sanded through a couple little spots, I touched up the ink, went out and put a coat of clear on this, and it's a marginal day. Now what happened, and this is going to happen to you from time to time, this is, this is the stuff that you know, I hope people can pick up off the video. What happened, you can see what's happened, I have no retarder in the clear, and what's happened is it's dried fuzzy like this. Now, there's a couple of things you definitely don't want to do. If you see it starting to fog up, one of the things you can do is add a little more retarder, run out and before it even dries, try to catch it. But that's, that's risky too, because if the second coat dries, then what happens is that foggy material stays in there. That's, and what that is, is trapped moisture. The dope skins over, and this happens with all lacquers. It skins over, and you wind up trapping moisture. A better way is I'll let this dry for maybe a couple of hours here. I have some time. I'm going to work on some other parts. I'm going to let this dry and take some 1200 sandpaper and just lightly sand the whole thing out. Then you add a little bit of retarder, just a little bit. Maybe I'll go to a one ounce into an eight ounce cup and give this another shot. But I'll, what I'll do, I'll just do the bottom of it, just a little spot that maybe I can see if it's going to fog up again. And again, if it fogs up, the best thing is then, then I have to wait for another, a whole other day when the moisture in the air is less, or if you have controlled shop conditions. Now we don't, <laughs> really have no control over anything, but the one thing you really don't want to do is just, if this starts fogging up, is panic and go put another coat of clear on top of it because you'll be trapping that moisture in there and then you have to sand off two coats of clear to get it out. So the trick is always do that little test. If you pick nothing up off the video, a lot of people are working in marginal conditions. That is a tip that's worth its weight in gold and it's saved, in my case, many, many planes. Now think of the difference. If all I have to do is sand out this part and recoat it, or if I was to shoot the whole mainframe of one of these planes and now I have to, oh, Always do the test. That's such a good tip. Now, while it's drying, we, we have one sanded out, and, and obviously I'm not going to uh, <laughs> not going to put any clear on this until I find out how the other piece is coming out. And now, if I don't sand through in any spots or buff through, there's no reason to put any more clear on. I can usually get away with just having the minimum, minimum amount. That's something you may or may not want to do now because I'm trying for as light a finish as possible. All I want to be able to do is not go through and hit ink lines when I'm sanding out with 1200. And from this point on, nothing goes on the plane. No, no sandpaper touches the plane except 1200 sandpaper. Gorham Silver Polish, and a product that I don't have in stock, I have to go buy some today called Final Shine. Final Shine is a, a polish that you use after you use Gorham Silver Polish. Now the other trick, and then it's really a good one. A lot of people, and I've done it too, and it's been a tremendous mistake, is you buff out a plane, and this is, this is going to be ready to buff out later today, I hope. One of, the, one of the things you can really make a mistake on is you get some of it buffed out and then you put carnauba wax or car wax on top of it. And what that does, it seals the lacquer and doesn't allow the last little bit of the material to outgas. You really shouldn't wax this. I like to think a month is the right time, but any polish that you use should have no silicone and no wax. Gorham's is good, Final Shine is good, and then when the plane is a month old or when you actually fly it, obviously, you'd want to put some carnauba wax would be uh, probably the first choice there.
you put wax over a finish, what happens? It seals it. It literally seals it. And if some of the material in there, the thinner and the chemicals that outgas in that first month or so, don't get out of the finish, it prevents it from hardening up and you're actually trapping weight in there too at the same time. So best thing is just have patience if you can and wait that month out. From this point in the finish on, this is, this is really critical. I always go by myself a whole sleeve and I usually use the better part of it. One of the things when you get to the final finishes you don't want to leave any scratches in the finish. If you're tempted to use 600, 1000, you may get scratches. When you use 1500, I find that I just sand forever and nothing ever comes off. I always start by making up some small sheets of paper and I try not to, I, I use them for, you know, maybe one area the size of an elevator and throw them away because I don't want to get any buildup, any little buildup in there. And now in this case, because I really only have one coat of clear over the repair areas, I don't want to get a tremendous, I don't want to go through 10 more spots. So I'm just looking to take off the material, wet the paper, and being able to fix parts that have fogged up is, is one of the things, you know, if you're, everybody gets to this point. Everybody wants to, oh gee, I gotta paint it today, I gotta paint it today. Get most of that fogginess off before you put the next coat on those. You run the risk. You, every once in a while you can get away with just adding some retarder to the paint and getting that second coat on and it will go away. But if it doesn't go away, you've trapped in two layers of clear and you've really made yourself a full day's work. Now it doesn't take a long time. As long as 1200 paper is new, and what I do then is rotate the paper, you want to keep a new cutting surface. Once it dulls rather quickly because you're dealing with a very, very fine grit here. And the Gorham's, I haven't found any substitute. Brodac dope or actually for any other finishing material. Gorham's silver polish is still the best that I've ever found. Bar none. Now we're going to be coming up on getting some of these parts with a nice buffed out shine pretty soon. I wanted to try because it's raining out there now, so I'm pretty well, <laughs> they we're not going to spray today. But that's what happens to the weather, it happens to everybody. What I wanted to try is, I already have a coat on here, and I want to just be careful and see what we're going to do at the end of this video. I didn't want to make this a buffing video, we have other buffing videos, and we're going to put some of the tips on the video that will follow this. There's only four videos in this set, but there'll be a, a separate buffing video, that's for sure of all the, uh, the little intricacies. I just wanted to show a little bit of this up here now. The 1200 paper, Gorham silver polish, and final shine. Those are the three ingredients to get any finish like this to pop. When I call pop, it, it'll come up. And you can get an idea what this is going to look like when that whole I-beam wing is buffed out. We're really going to have something special. You can see the dull sanded side and the buff side. And maybe that's something you can pick up off the video. And every plane you have from this point on, you have the option of putting that kind of a finish on it. But if you're looking, which is what I'm trying to do, to keep the finish as light as possible, any spot that you buff through or you go through, and we'll put more details on that what amounts to be the new, all new buffing video, the next one. One of the things, as soon as you have a spot you buff through, you want to be able to touch up the paint or the ink, and then just put just a little bit of clear. You don't want to re-clear the whole part. And that's one of the tricks toward keeping a finish as light as possible. Because this material, another characteristic it has is it repairs beautifully. You can put a little clear on the corner, let it dry two or three days, sand and buff it out, you'd never know that that part's repaired. I have repairs already on the plane. If you get a bubble in a fillet, you can put a bunch of little pinholes in the fillet, fill it with pinholes, let some thin CA get in there, press it down with a Q-tip and just buff it right out. Add a little bit of paint with brush if, if you don't want to see the pinholes. A lot of times, a lot of times having a material and a lot of the epoxy finishes and Imran finishes, very difficult or impossible to repair, to do little spot repairs. You always see the end of the repair. When you can buff out a material like this, 
it's not a problem at all. You can make you can make the repair for all purposes just disappear. Well, you you won't even find it a week later. Material just buffs. This this is the fifth day. Fifth. One. This is the fifth day that this is drying and it's already buffing out. Now, in the past, other materials, if you try to buff them, even a month later, they're chewing gum, they're filling up the sandpaper with, with chewing gum, and, oh, it's so frustrating. This this goes so quickly, I can't picture anybody that wouldn't be able to do this reasonably. Okay, today you can see the little area where we had to add a little bit of clear for the touch-up. Now, it's a good idea when you do that, let it dry a day or two before you buff it out, that's for sure. Now, once the parts are at least a week old, and I would say for sure they have to be a week old, then what I like to do is get the final shine out. The final shine will put the final... What final shine does, it gets rid of sanding scratches. And since we're going to ma be making a separate, totally dedicated buffing video, I don't want to spend the last maybe 10 minutes of this video going over buffing. Buffing is a whole, it could take up the better part of another tape, but once you get to this point, you can see there's still little scratches in it, even with 1200. Now you might be thinking, why doesn't he just go to 1500? Well, what I found is 1500 just gets so labor intensive to <laughs> to get the job done, you could spend a year buffing out a plane. As it takes, Joe, Joe Adamusco keeps track of the time he spends, and you're talking between 40 and 60 hours. Takes me more like 60, Joe does it in about 40, but I try to do it in bites that are reasonable so I don't have a you know, muscle man arm or something at the end of the day. But these parts, these parts are ready for the final shine. The final shine adds just a, a beautiful gloss to everything. And that's the final step. Only thing with final shine, it's really labor intensive. It's like like anything that really works. It takes a lot of rubbing and scrubbing to get that final polish. But it is really, really a super product. Now, what I usually do with final shine too is just before the nats, just before any any time I'm going to have the plane on display. Go over it again. Use it like it's wax. It has a, a very, very mild abrasive. It doesn't take, you can see that, that none of the paint, virtually none of the paint comes off, but it leaves on a, a highly, you can actually feel it. Now the problem with it is you either have two choices. You can go to a body shop and buy a gallon of it, and that's in the neighborhood of $100. Most people don't need to do that. So what they do is... I, I put it in four ounce jars, which is probably a, a more economical four ounces, I'll do a whole plane. But it's a really good product. It's one of the things that uh, I hope sooner or later we'll get direct from John Blodak. It's an excellent, excellent material. You can, let me just clean it off. When it puts a final shine, and it, that, that's really the name of it, final shine is the name. Boy, it, it is just nothing but... And like I said, we're going to have a whole separate video with a lot more buffing. Buffing is a very, very intense, has a lot of little tricks and tips for the purpose of shooting the clear, getting the clear on. I think this will suffice, and we're almost at the end of this tape anyway. But if you can get this finish on your ship, I think all the information you need to do that is contained on this set of four videos. Not only, not only does it serve a purpose of makes the plane more aerodynamic, but wiping the plane off, then it's, it just has a feel. It's hard to describe. Once the final shine is on there, it has a feel of, and it's just really, really nice. Now, there's a separate tape, and I'll mention it again just for somebody who may not really realize. There's a separate tape that we've done in between the last two shootings where we buffed out all the dope in detail. And it, that, that subject alone is just far too complex to try to squeeze onto the last ten minutes of a tape. That's tape five of this series. There's four tapes on the actual painting, one tape on the buffing for the people that may want to buff. I put the plane together the other day after shooting that tape just to walk around, take a look at it, see if there was any other spots I needed to touch up, anything I wanted to work on, but 
we're pretty much finished with this right now. The next step, of course, is to glue the hinges in, tank vents, get the motor in it, spinner, all that stuff will be on other tapes that are separate from this series. Anyway, I hope you've gotten, number one, some really good information. Good information that you can put to work right away. And not information that's made to, uh, you know, to pretty much make it look like you have to be a rocket scientist to use this material. I think any average modeler can use this material with a little bit of help from the video, a little bit of patience. You can pretty much get close to or even maybe better than the results I've had. This is the first from start to finish, and if you've watched the whole series of tapes, you know we started with the I-beam wing, right from the tissue and the first coat of dope up, to right here to where the ship is totally buffed out, ready to do the final assembly, and then actually get down to the field, and we're going to get some test flights on this, on our next series of tapes, which will be the Jet 60 development tape, we're going to be trying to get some test flights. We're going to obviously do a lot more work with the Brodak Dope over the summer. We have several other planes in the shop right now to be painted. People that are trying to pick up tips, ideas. We're trying to learn from each other. We're going to do our stunt seminar in England. Hopefully get a lot of people uh, interested in using and maybe even sharing what they know with us. we got a lot of good things coming up. It's just really the best of all times to be a stunt flyer. So anyway, I hope you have enjoyed the whole series of tapes. And that you'll possibly even check out tape number five, the buffing tape. Good information on that also. And also consider this. Consider either individually or as your club. Many of the clubs sub subscribe to the tapes. And sharing them with your friends. Most of all, share everything. And by doing that, I think we can keep this hobby really alive and healthy for many years to come. And just remember, Brodak Dope didn't just happen automatically. It was the, the joint effort of Randolph, John Brodak, myself, and several people that have joined us in the test program. And we're really looking forward to very soon 